And I feel a lot of people prematurely give up because they already decide in their own mind what's possible. And if life is too good, you're never going to change. I'm Dr. Jeff Spencer. This is Win the Day with James Whitaker. You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California. Here's your host, James Whitaker. Hey, winners. Welcome back to Win the Day. If this is your first time here, we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote for this episode comes from Benjamin Franklin and says, Well done is better than well said. Our guest today is Dr. Jeff Spencer, a man who has spent five decades creating champions. At the age of 11, Jeff wrote a contract with himself to make the 1972 Olympic Games, a goal he accomplished where he competed in two separate cycling events and in the process solidified his fascination with goal achievement. As a human performance visionary and legendary cornerman coach, Dr. Spencer has helped, has helped athletes win over 40 gold medals and cycling teams to eight Tour de France victories. Dr. Spencer has also authored three books, been awarded International Sports Chiropractor of the Year, is creator of the Champions Blueprint Methodology, and had his glass-blowing art displayed in some of the world's finest galleries. Today, Dr. Spencer is most renowned as mentor to thought leaders and businesses who want to exponentially grow and catapult to iconic status. Some of his notable clients include Tiger Woods, the band U2, Lance Armstrong, Nike, Hitachi, and Bulletproof. However, his proudest achievement is raising his adopted daughter, Ken, with his wife, Christina. In a nutshell, if there's something you want to achieve, there's no one you want in your corner more than Dr. Spencer. In this episode, we're going to talk about what it takes to perform and succeed at the highest level, why most people fail with their goals, the most essential parts of your daily routine, and how you can achieve the so-called unachievable goals in your personal life and in your business. As we say for every episode, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with the cornerman, Dr. Jeff Spencer. Jeff, great to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for the invite. Let's do it. (laughs) I'm so excited for this chat, and I've got so many questions for you. Uh, A lot of your work is about helping people connect with that calling to a higher game. Uh, What do you remember as your first calling to do something far greater than the circumstances that you were in? Well, I think that's been a lifetime situation for me. It's interesting you say that because somebody asked me yesterday, well, what are the dreams that you have chased and that are chasing? And I said, well, you know what? I I don't really chase genes. I don't chase dreams. What I do is that I answer callings. Mm -hmm. And so there's something about the gravity between opportunity and myself that I've always found that leads to predictable uh, uh, exponential uh, results and uh, that's the way that I've kind of always done that in the way that I've always had it and it's worked to really well for me. Is there an element of that? You know, a lot of people talk about the law of attraction, but too many people only talk about thinking. I feel like when you've got your entire life in order, you follow the blueprint that you're following, opportunities, you just naturally attract your way. Is that how? Is that sort of how you feel about yeah, it? I think, I think it's more being in a state of receivership, quite honestly. It's like rather than chasing things around and trying to find things and looking under every rock, that takes a lot of time and energy. Yeah. It's also got a lot of frustration attached to it. And that's what most people do. But I, I feel that if you are able to stay in a receivership where you sit there quietly and you kind of do a petition mm-hmm. to, to summon opportunity and the promise is, is that I'll give everything a look, I will not discard anything, but you have an open invitation to present yourself, then some of the most magic stuff happens that you could never conceive of in advance. And I found that if you want to play the exponential game and play the long game, you have to have enough energy to get yourself to multiple finish lines over time, and that's what I found to be most successful. It, it also, it's the most contrarian. People would say, well, rather than sit there and wait, well, why don't you go do something? And I say, well, that's not exactly true. You put soft offense against opportunity, then those that uh, have the ability to reveal themselves then do that. I've always found that to be just a, a, an incredible recipe for creating a life of exponential where it doesn't put the wear and tear on the body and mind that 
most of the ambitions that we are pursued do. Yeah, it's so true. Uh, your parents divorced when you were 12. Uh, your dad was an artistic genius who yeah. died homeless on the streets of New York City. Right. How did significant life events <laughs> like that shape the lens through which you viewed the world? Well, I think it's hard to say. I mean, in that respect, it's like I never knew that parents were to teach you anything. I thought that they were to provide maybe some shelter or something along those lines. So I, I didn't have the berating parent that told me that I couldn't do something or you better behave yourself, blah, blah, blah. But then again, I was a, a bit of a property of the streets, but I was really lucky that I had just beautiful angels that came into my life at strategic times that served me really well in terms of the lessons that I was receptive to that they were able to give to me. And what were the attributes that you had, like drawing the link between there and then making it to the Olympic Games? What were some of the attributes that you were born with that the right mentors could then sort of help uh, encourage further along with you? What were some of those things that you had instinctively? Well, no, no doubt that I have the self-start gene. I don't need any motivation whatsoever. I, I'm just a self-generating person that has a natural capacity for being able to engage and see things through from start to finish. Uh, I'm also, uh, I'm not malicious. I'm very curious about things, but I don't get bored easily. I know how to commit. Um, I'm also uh, take good instructions and I solicit wisdom. So mm-hmm. I think those are the the magic uh, things that uh, attracted uh, others to me that were willing to give me uh, a helping hand. So that that element of being coach uh, coachable, yeah. you, you feel like you already had that instinctively? Oh, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. because yeah, I didn't have, I think this is a really important distinction as well, is that I was only driven by the uh, inquiry as to what's the possibility that sits in front of me. It was never to try to show people that told me I couldn't to show them that I could. I don't think that's a reason for doing anything. You're playing on their side of the playing field if that's the way you look at it. I just feel that we have an opportunity here to create an extraordinary life experience if we stay in receivership to be able to select those things that are presented and we have the courage to be able to embrace them and see them through to whatever the finish line is. And when you know you're being called to a higher game, you may not know how you're going to get there, but it doesn't matter. It's almost as if you've already won before you even started. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you put in an unbelievable amount of work to make it to the Olympics. Uh, Who or what was the best thing to have in your corner on that journey of getting you to the Olympics? Well, no doubt. It was my cycling coach who, who chose me. And he came to me when I was 13 and he said, I want you to come train with my training group. And his training group was all Olympians and uh, only national champions. And he said, you're not going to do our training, but I'm going to tell you what to do for your training. But the reason why I want you to come is that I want you to be around this conversation because this is the real conversation that you need to be exposed to. If you have this within you to be able to receive it, it will awaken that in you because I can't put anything into you. If it's not naturally there, then there's nothing I can do. Mm -hmm. And so I was there. It did awaken something within me. I did have the capacity to understand, and I had the willingness to do what I had to do from my side of the aisle to honor that privilege. And eventually, over time, there were more people that came into my life that supported me in a similar way. And Mm That allowed me to do some of the things that you've shared with us in the introduction. In your experience, have you found that anything like a, so it's not necessarily always the first sibling who does so well in terms of big performance. It's the the second or third sibling who's busy chasing the older, you know, maybe you had like an older brother who was great at tennis or cricket, Mm -hmm. whatever the sport might be. I never had that. No, it's like I was always self-motivated. I always Mm -hmm. felt like I had my own path. Everybody's got their own path. I, I never was intimidated by people. I never, again, thought that I had to prove anything to anybody. So it was a matter of, you know, do I have the courage to, number one, contemplate an option that seems maybe perhaps impossible, but I never felt like that. I felt like if something is put in your way and there's a natural attraction and you know how your truth speaks to you, then it's pretty easy to engage because, you again, you kind of know what the outcome is before you start. Mm-hmm but it doesn't exempt you from doing the time and the effort that it takes mm. to be able to manifest that. Mm. And those Olympic Games, 1972 in, yeah. in Munich, obviously some some crazy things that, that happened yeah. there. Uh, how often do you replay those events in, in your head of what happened? Well, I don't know if it's, I mean, the Olympics is an interesting thing because there's really three parts to it. There's everything that precedes it. So for me, it was a 10 year commitment that I was responsible for. And it's like, if I didn't make it, I was still responsible for that 10 years. And so, you know, I never thought about that really, but in a sense, like, it's one thing to get there. My odds of getting there were one in 360 million. So, you know, that wasn't really good odds, but I never thought about that. You know, never never consideration to me. It's like, well, it seems possible and I'll show up for duty and I'll do what I got to do to uh, be of service to the calling that that I did receive. But then there's the Olympics itself, the competition. It's gnarly. Because I can tell you this, is that the most important thing that the Olympics taught me is that 
the elusive one or two percent look if we're honest about it we all have something that holds us back that just won't let us go all in it's just too, too scary to do that if you're going to be an olympian you have to learn to confront that and you have to learn to call that up on command when you need it and you have to come from that place that's not an easy place to get to and so the competition itself was its own unique experience because it's like the countdown clock is going to happen whether you're ready or not. You have to make the decision, am I going to step up and step into this with everything that I've got? And our human nature always thinks we need another month, we need another day, I'm not really prepared yet. Well, forget that because that doesn't exist in the Olympians' world. The Olympians' world is you're ready to step onto the field anytime in any place and be able to get the job done despite the circumstances. But then after the Olympics are over, then there's the uh, decompression from it as you go through your event like only like 500 million times you replay the event what could have been done better you know blah 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 the usual top topsy list of things that you go through and there's a lot of reconciliation that has to happen and the other side of this is that when you play at the olympic level you never look at life the same again i can understand why astronauts go to the moon and they come back different you know they see the earth from the moon it, it changes their perspective it's exactly the same thing with the olympics you can see what's possible that transcends what most people think is even probable. And so the whole scaling is completely different. And so with that, um, I believe that there is a part of the Olympian that's always there. I mean, I still react right now as I was in the Olympics. I don't think that that Olympic competitiveness uh, ever leaves you. And, and I was not a combat veteran mm -hmm. of trying to, again, prove to myself that I was better than others. To me, it was exploring what the limits of my possibility really was. So what I love about you is the fact that you get so much excitement and thrill out of helping other people yeah, achieve absolutely. their Everest, their gold medal, their, their milestone. Yeah. Was that almost a survival instinct for you that once the Olympics were over, you're like, wow, I actually need to allocate my energy and my motivation towards something else? And you found that into these other people? Well, I, I, didn't, think so. I didn't think that at all. I, I really felt like there are natural uh, chapters in our life that have a natural beginning and a natural conclusion. You know, we're not meant to do one thing indefinitely. And I, I never took my identity from what I did, whether I showed my glass art in the best galleries in New York City, whether I was International Sports Chiropractor of the Year. It, I, I never looked at those things as identity pieces that I took with me that spoke on my behalf. I always thought that it was part of me that answered the call at a certain time that had a certain significance in terms of creating my own legacy and the lessons that I learned, but also the lessons that I passed on to others. Mm -hmm. Because I want to make sure if I have anything to say about it, that everybody else on this planet has a chance to play at their highest potential. I, I do know what it's like to pay at full potential. It is one of the most euphoric experiences in the human experience that I could ever hope to describe or hope that everyone should experience it once in their lifetime. So you never went through the achievement hangover that they talk about? For no, people I never who did that. No, I, because I only thought that this is a, a natural progression and there's always going to be something on the other side of this. And as I said, I never felt that like that was my identity. That was something that chose me to do that I was honored to fulfill. It was a great collaboration mm -hmm. and at a certain point. I don't get bored. I don't put things down because I'm bored and I need uh, a dopamine hit. That, that, that's not me. You know, there's a certain calling that you kind of know where you need to be when to be able to service your purpose on this planet. You know, wherever that goes, you kind of follow the path and you see where it ends up. And mm -hmm. so, again, my motivation, I think, is like quite a bit different from what I hear other people describe it to be. What about calming your mind the night before, you know, so you can sleep properly the night before uh, going out to the Olympics or, or whatever event that people have got to do that's, that's extremely important to them? No, well, you just have to learn to come from your champion's mind, not from your human mindset. You know, your human mindset is fear-based. You know, it's like, well, what are I saying to lose here? So all you do is sit and you, you worry about all the things that could go wrong. Well, yeah, Olympians don't do that. You know, you look at the one or two things that have to go right. And you know, when you step onto the field, you execute those one or two things and that's how you win. Mm -hmm. So it requires a lot of mental discipline, but it's not a rigid mindset. Like I'm going to go out and mow everybody down to show everybody how tough I am. It isn't like that. Mm -hmm. It's like, we know human nature, we know human nature is susceptible, and it's entirely predictable. And we know that if we do not control our human nature, we have to supersede it with our supernatural nature to do what has to go right to, to be able to prevail. And that's mm -hmm. probably the most important take home, because if we're going to live a life of distinction and a life of quality, aspiration, value, and contribution... It's exactly the same lessons. We have to learn restraint, the most important word in the prolific achievers' vocabulary. We have to be in stand in receivership. We know how, need to know how to commit. We need to know how to say no. We know, need to know how to abstain. We need to know how to step up and deliver on the goods when it really counts. 
So by restraint there, you're talking about delaying instant gratification and the enjoyment of a reward that will get a much greater reward down the track? Well, I, I would say that it's more resisting our human nature tendency to talk ourselves into things that aren't real. Mm. I mean, so for example, human nature is given an opportunity. It's, well, what do I stand to lose here? Champions don't think like that. You know, it's, what do I stand to gain here? You know, given an opportunity, the uh, human mindset, because it's fear-based, it's survival-based, it's not about excellence. It doesn't care about your Olympic gold medals. It only cares about survival. You, you can't get the excellence if you're reacting at a life based on survival. It, you just can't get there from that. So we need to recognize that there is a biology there that holds us back, and that's not the us. We think it's us because it happens through us, but it's actually a survival biology. And if we don't get that, we don't know how to transcend it, then you can't get to the winner's circle. It's not possible. So that story that we tell ourselves about the champion's mindset, do we have to consciously refer to ourselves as the champion? So many great athletes, they, they say that I was the champion before I, even knew I, before I even knew I was. People like Muhammad Ali. Is it important to recognize yourself as a champion before it is physically manifested? Well, I, I think you have to have an inclination about what your truth is and where you belong. And can you commit to what's in front of you? I think that's the deal. I mean, you don't call yourself a champion and become it. I mean, it's a presence of being that just kind of like is. You never think about it. Mm -hmm. And you do what's naturally to come from that place where you feel most comfortable coming from. And so in, in that respect, I think we all have our place in the champion's world. Mm -hmm. But the champion's mindset, notice I use two different words here. Human mindset is a rigid set of ideas and concepts that we think to be true that kind of actually aren't. They're really part of our survival biology, some of the mythology that we tell ourselves, where the champion's mind is really different because the champion's not, mind is, is not a rote set of actions that are applied hoping they will produce an outcome. The champion's mind is a living, breathing organism that looks at thoughtfully and consciously at opportunities, it sizes it up, it can route, store, edit, interpret, and transmit information. Mm -hmm. And it can select the best options based upon the context. So it's a completely different ballgame. So when we say mindset, it's rigid. When we're talking about champion mind, we're talking about flexibility to be able the opportunity to recognize opportunity and to be able to know what to do to be able to seize it rather than stumble over a preventable problem. I think this is so important, these distinctions. Is there examples that you can share of what someone can tell themselves to succeed in an everyday scenario, perhaps one in a professional sense, maybe someone's going to a job interview or they're about to speak on stage for the first time or give a TED talk, as well as something perhaps in, in, in the family situation in the home? Yeah, for sure. There's always strategies that you have to have to come from your best self. Otherwise, your survival self is going to do the talking for you, and that never ends well. We all know that. We've always... Most of us have been surprised by something, and we say something faster than we can think. How'd that turn out? Never well, good. <laughs> never good, right. But no, that wasn't me. Well, wait a minute. It came from you, so it has to be you. But that's really the survival side of you. That's not the champion side. So if we, the champion, know that, then we can prepare ourselves to come with the champion response rather than the human mindset reaction that can't take us to where we want to get to. Mm. So there's always a strategy for everything. And what about your role as a, as a chiropractor? When did that first enter your radar? And did you reach a point where you just thought, you know what, now is the time for me to start to connect my career as an athlete with my um, experience and research as a chiropractor with all the other elements of human performance? Well, really it came from, because when I graduated, I got my master's to be in, in sports science from the University of Southern California. So I knew the academics of uh, peak performance and a couple of things we need to acknowledge here is that. If you're going to be a standout performer and create a life of value and contribution of significance and leave a great legacy, you got to be able to push. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't push, you can't do it. it has to go right when it has to go right to take you to the rarefied era of high achievement. But you also have to stay in the game over the long term. And many people blow themselves up prematurely because they push too hard too quick. Mm -hmm. And then that actually shortens their runway. So they actually can make less contributions to their life legacy than could have been had they managed their energy and managed their time and managed their health, et cetera. And so um, as I was, when I graduated with my master's degree, I helped athletes win a bunch of gold medals. Uh, that came naturally to me because I was an Olympian. Yet you cannot help people become an Olympian unless you've been one. You can't study Olympians and interview Olympians and become an Olympian. There has to be something that's innately inside your DNA that allows you to see the nuances to tease out that extra one or 2% that really makes a difference. So I was doing that with athletes, business people came to me, said, hey, Jeff, I want to become my own champion. You must know something about that. Can you help me? So yeah, I helped them become their own champions. But the athletes came and said, I need to extend my career. Injury management and injury prevention are the name of the game. And the business people came to me and say, look, I don't want to die from a stroke or a heart attack like my same age counterparts. Can you help me? 
So I realized, look, I can go back to school. I can get a primary licensure to be able to help the business people with their wellness programs. I can work with the athletes, help them with their injury prevention and management programs. So what I was able to provide my clients with, number one, I knew how to win. I was an expert in winning because I was an Olympian. I also knew the academics of physical readiness to be able to do what has to go right, to do the action steps in this third dimension that we live in, to be able to get from where we are into the winner circle. But I also knew how to manage their health. So what people saw in me, oh, well, we can go to Jeff because he knows a little bit about everything, has a proficiency that can create our recipes specific to ourselves. He can do what 10 experts can do for us, but he can integrate all the parts specific to us. So that's how I was able to work with Lance, U2, Bono, Beyond Branson's Island, things like that was because of my universality and my ability to read all of the trains necessary and to know what was necessary to put together for the individual or for the team. So that's how I got into the rarefied era, the people that I've had the blessing and good fortune to work with. Yeah, you got a very unique set of skills that I imagine will be very applicable to basically every situation. It it really is. I mean, right now, there's nothing that I haven't seen at the highest level. So (laughs) nothing surprises me. And I can see the patterns happening. So I know how to do what to be able to capitalize on opportunities and avoid the preventable problems. Do you enjoy watching sport these days to, to really find out like and trying to understand what's going on in someone's head in real time? I already know, but it's yeah. interesting to watch it to see how it plays itself out. Most predictably, perfect example is a prevent defense in football. You know, when they're ahead, then they go into the prevent defense, they throw these small balls underneath and then they score touchdowns. All of a sudden the team that was ahead loses because they went from playing a solid offense to playing a a protective defense. Why would you do that? Mm. Well, human nature tells you that you have to survive and you have to protect yourself, but not at the risk of not playing your best game. So there's all sorts of uh, reasons why I I watch sports, because I'm really uh, interested in the incredible predictability when people are on the edge of a breakthrough, they blow it almost every time because they start changing the game. So again, there's lots of things that we can do to make sure at critical moments we don't fumble the ball. How do you feel about Tom Brady? He retired recently. How do you feel about him, someone as a champion who was known for just the comebacks and, and everything else? Is he just built different to everyone else? Well, I think we all are hardwired preferentially to something, but it's not to say that what Tom has done is any more honorable than somebody that is not in the limelight. I think we all play a best role in life and we should never discount the value of what we do because the Tom Brady's need people that are unseen to do for him what he has to do if he's going to showcase himself. So again, everybody, in my opinion, plays a vital role. And as long as we stick with doing what's most suitable for us to to be of service to humanity, then we're doing our job as a person. I, I do feel that, I mean, you could look at this in a variety of different ways. I mean, did Tom hang on too long? What do you think? I mean, he could have walked away with an unblemished record, correct? Mm -hmm. That's possible. Lance, similarly, uh, you see this all the time in prize fighters. They always want to come back and they usually don't weather well. And so I think stepping away is always a very difficult contemplative decision that carries levels of complexity that may not seem obvious to the average person. But I think in many instances, you have to make a decision is to where the value is going to be placed, how do you want to be seen and regarded over time and over history, then you can can decide at that point. So again, I think it's legitimate from the athlete's perspective, but sometimes I think there are other options that should have been exercised that weren't carefully thought through or they weren't conceived of as being appropriate either of those. Mm, Yeah, the thrill of being in the arena versus even just being the coach, it's got to be just a slightly different level of excitement. And uh, throughout your work, something that you've done that that you've emphasized that I think is so important is the role of team. No one succeeds alone. The people that Tom Brady has got, he's got, you know, coaching dozens of people on the the coaching staff (laughs) and so many other players. Um, Out of all the people you work with, what was the first moment when you were working with someone where you were like, oh my God, this is is really happening or this is like a really interesting uh, person that I'm working with here? I've thought they're all unique uh, in a sense that even the young athletes that I work with initially that were obscure and nobody knew about them, they were a potential in the making. And so I never discounted the possibility of what they could become. So for me to see them develop a sense of uh, confidence in themselves and be able to elevate their game was in a certain sense just equally as important as seeing a, a team win a Tour de France on eight occasions or somebody won a national or world championship, they they all carry their similar gravity for me because uh, what makes me 
thrilled is when I see somebody develop that self-belief and confidence in themselves and their ability to manifest what their potential is and create a legacy of, of, of value and contribution. Mm-hmm. You work with Lance, I think it was for all of the Tour de France victories, yeah, I did all seven it? of the tours with Lance, yeah. Yeah. Did, did Lance have to go through cancer to become Lance Armstrong and have that success? I know there were physical things that had happened as yeah, well. Yeah, well, I, I, I think the one thing here, that, you know, Lance is a very philosophical guy and he's a bit radioactive in terms of how he's received by, mm-hmm. by people, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so with that, the one thing that I can say about him is that he never expected anybody to do uh, anything. He would never expect uh, people to do more than he would do 10 times over. But I would also say that, you know, on the cancer side of it, um, you know, when you faced something so... Uh, potentially lethal to you. It changes how you look at life because, you know, a couple of things that he said that I think are worth repeating, like um, pain is temporary, but quitting is forever. Um, or when you get a second chance, you go all the way. So I get, I get that from his context, but I felt that uh, at his physical best that um, he, when you face something so bad, like you just imagine you got cancer in your brain, 15 golf ball size metastasis, Cancer's in your lungs, you've got it in your abdomen, you've got a testicle the size of a lemon. I mean, to give yourself odds of survival, that's pretty generous, quite honestly. Mm-hmm. And to say that on the other side of that, um, I never felt that Lance thought that maybe the pain that he was experiencing on a, on a bicycle. I mean, the, the tr- bicycle racing is all about pain. It's how much pain can you endure, how long. I mean, that's really what it's about. Mm-hmm. But I feel like most of us as humans, we will barter with ourselves on how much effort we'll put for what the perceived return gain might be. So there's always a bartering. I'll give 100% of myself if you give me 90% chance of X, right? But I don't think Lance ever looked at it like that because mm. he looked at, in my opinion, he looked at pain um, not as the adversary or the foe, but uh, as a reminder that he was still alive. And I feel like that was a uh, a privilege to be able to experience it because I don't know anybody that would experience it in that way. So in a certain sense, like every breath after the recovery from a very difficult prognosis that was generous at best, Mm -hmm. it changes how you look at life in a very permanent way that you can understand unless you've lived that type of experience. Mm. Did he, would he have needed to have been involved in a domain like cycling and and the Tour de France? Like could, could he have been just as successful say in the corporate world if that was his, his domain that he chose? Well, I I think we all have a natural gravity towards those things that we're best at, whether it's locker room or boardroom, I don't think that it really matters. What does matter is did we, show up and be of service to our highest calling and where our assets would uh, provide us with the highest quality of life, but also serve as an example to other people what's possible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, knowing Lance and his uh, competitiveness, his physical assets, all the things, it seemed like a very logical thing. And I think the results uh, proved to be the case. And I don't think any of us should swim upstream and do something that we're not particularly adept at or Mm. we don't have a passion for. We'll be back with the show in a moment. Over the last few years, I've coached thousands of people in pretty much every industry you can think of to level up in their career and in their life. And these people all have three things in common. They get energy from other high achievers, they want to make a difference in the world, and they have an intense desire to maximize their potential. Well, this September, I'm hosting the first ever in-person Win the Day Mastermind for seven and eight figure business leaders. Over two days, I'll be guiding you to start activating your high performance life. And I'm bringing in the big guns, real industry rock stars to help. We'll be making sure you have the right commitment, the right plan and the right team to win. So if you're a business leader and want to join the next generation of change makers, join me in the Win the Day Mastermind. To register or for more info, go to jameswitt.com slash events or click the link in the show notes. All right, let's get back to the podcast. Uh, for anyone who's an athlete, especially in, in your own field as well, anything that you're doing that's absolutely pushing your limit, what do you say to yourself to sort of push through the wall to get to that next that next level so you can continue to do that? Well, in the Tour de France, I mean, it, it, I, I was boots on the ground for nine Tour de France's, so I, I know I know it intimately. And, and it's the ultimate life clinic because you face in three weeks what you're going to face in a lifetime in terms of life experiences and opportunities and challenges. I mean, seriously, mm-hmm. it's that difficult because your brain and your body is at the absolute limit every day for almost a month. And you can't go home and sleep it off. You can't have bad days. If you're sick or energy, you get dressed and you go to work. I mean, it's just the way it is. You may ride six hours in freezing rain. I mean, it's just... 
I'm sorry, it's just the way it is. I mean, it has to be the toughest sport on the planet by virtue of that, but it's also a team dynamic where you can't have the luxury of doing whatever you want. I mean, you got to show up as a teammate and you know get the job done. So in that respect, I feel like the the tour, again, is a, the ultimate, uh, because again, you can't go home and sleep it off. I mean, you have to find a way beyond whatever it is. And whatever that is, you find a way beyond it. And I feel a lot of people prematurely give up because they already decide in their own mind what's possible. Mm -hmm. But you don't know what's possible until you have to figure it out and you have to show up and you have to prove your merit and you have to deliver on the promise to your teammates. Mm -hmm. Whole different deal. You might have answered it there. What sport do you think the mental edge helps the best with the physical edge? I think that's hard to say. I mean, you look at motocross and in cars, well, maybe it's a little bit more machine than driver, but then again, the driver drives the machine to its highest capacity. Cycling is different because the rolling resistance of the bike allows you to push a little bit harder than running. You know, running is a little bit more definitive because of the pounding of running. Mm -hmm. So I think they all have their unique challenges that sit that fit a certain mentality and physical readiness. Mm. Have you ever worked with anyone who's, say, a boxer or UFC type, like fighting style? No, I have not. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know if that matters because yeah. their biology doesn't lend itself to the Tour de France and vice mm. versa. You know, the combat readiness of a very physical body that is ready for some physical combat, you know, lends itself to certain things. So mm. I think that, again, no matter how you slice the pie, I don't think that when Tiger concentrates on a putt that a putt that's any different than uh uh you know see fighter having to find the grit and the metal to stay in the game and make good calculated choices in the heat of the battle i, I think they're relatively the same because they're both metal games mm. uh, you mentioned tiger who you've worked with which is mm. amazing what are the superpowers that makes tiger wood so great oh well, the first time I, I interfaced with him we were talking and he said is this serious and he looked at me with penetrating eyes which means that People at the top are really interested in getting real-time, real information. They don't want to hear a story that they'd like to hear, but they want to know the reality of it, and they want to know their optionality. And that's a characteristic that every one of these people at the top has, actually. They're conscientious. They're fastidious competitors. They're responsible to themselves. They seek out and uh, seek counsel from people, but they make their own decisions. Um, they don't want to be uh, coddled. Uh, they're, uh, again, responsible to the outcomes. It's a, it's a very different type of mentality. And they just are people from the inside out that want to have an honest human interaction. Mm. I feel like Tiger Woods is so unique. I've seen him in person at the Genesis Open yeah. here multiple times. Yeah. There are thousands of people watching right. him, yet there are other golfers on, on the holes all around him that have barely right. anyone there. It must be right. just incredible, that level of mental fortitude that someone must have like him, where everywhere he goes, he just has these these throngs of people. And anyone who's played golf before knows how difficult it can be to play well for 18 holes. There's something about it mentally that just breaks you. But he is someone who has been so dominant for so long that he clearly has a very strong mental edge well i think again we constitutionally have a capacity for certain things and we need to be where our capacities can manifest themselves most appropriately mm -hmm. but then there's a training side of this too and there's the ability to be able to know how to regulate that so it can be applied correctly when it needs to be applied mm -hmm. it requires a lot of discipline and a lot of this stuff is learned behavior people think you're born with it or you have a special gift yeah there is a certain proclivity towards certain things but it's really a discipline of, of learning and knowing how to apply and knowing how to restrain ourselves from certain things and to stay in receivership, surround yourself with good counsel, being able to adapt to things, read things correctly, not get too domesticated or believe in your own PR. I mean, there's all sorts of elements here that uh, anybody could learn from. Do we expect too much of these superstars who, who off, the, you know, off the field, their life might be a little bit of a mess, but on the field, they're, they're so dominant? Like, is it unrealistic for the general public to expect their favorite sporting idol to be uh, not necessarily perfect? But I feel like there is an expectation that these people should be perfect, uh, you know, on and off the field. Well, I think we, we all have, again, inclinations towards certain things that are just part of the package. But if we look at uh, human nature, we're conflicted by just by virtue of the fact that we're human. I mean, Spencer's law is that there's more than zero people in a room, it's trouble. Because we have enough difficulty managing ourselves because of the nuances, the blind spots, the historical experiences that we have that shape the framework of how we respond and look at things. I mean, all of that needs to be considered. Mm -hmm. And most people uh, need to, I think, generously give a consideration to people in their private lives and give them the opportunity to find their way forward because life is complex. Uh, every one of us gets a raw deal in a certain sense and we need to find our way forward. Mm. 
Mm. What about someone who has overcome or, or had a very public adversity? Maybe there's poss- possibly even criminal charges or an injury or anything like that. How does someone uh, divorce um, challenges with their children? How do people overcome a very public public implosion so they can continue to do their best in, in their domain? Well, a lot of that is uh, personal forgiveness because we all do what makes sense to us at the time, but it may not make sense in retrospect. And I think we all should be given a certain level of grace, of course, depending upon the severity of whatever it is, to find our way back because what does matter is the person that we're becoming, not the person that we once were. Mm. And uh, to me, the most important thing is that you got to get back up on the horse if you fall, but you have to do it with great intention. You have to do it in a very specific way where it's not too much too fast. You don't have to go on a super apology tour if it's not necessary. You, you really have to regulate it in a very, very respectful, well-paced way. And mm. there's always a path back to redemption generally speaking, but it has to be handled in a very, very delicate way. Mm. And you have to own it? You have to own what, what's transpired publicly? Well, of course. I mean, yeah. I mean, you did it, right? So you have to own your part of whatever you did. But what does matter is the person that you're becoming. Mm. There's always ways of redemption, in, in my experience, for the most part. Mm. And I think people need to be given that level of consideration in a reasonable way, of course. Mm. And you know, again, if you're going to be someone in the limelight, it's better to have a really good second half than a really good first half and a bad second half, you know, because again, you kind of always remember what you saw in the evolution of a person. I, I do believe that people are willing just to forgive others of certain trespasses if we have evidence that the person has truly been able to transcend that. Mm. Uh, in the interview with Dr. Daniel Amen, he mentioned this idea of anxiety. He said people shouldn't avoid anxiety. He's, he, his belief was of a scale out of 100, if my memory serves me correctly. People should want to be around that. And he's talking about everyday people here, not yeah. necessarily high-performance athletes. You should live at about that level of 30 out of 100 from an anxiety thing. So you have at least a little bit of consideration on what you're doing because that can bring out your best. Was there any anxiety or negative self-talk that you went through or that you saw with the with the world's top performers that actually enabled them to have a superior performance on the big day? Well, I think, again, I don't think – there's a difference between negative self-talk and biologic readiness. And if we're talking about biologic readiness with the classic signs of being in a stressful situation or being fearful, sweaty palms, dilated pupils, increased respiration, I mean, that's really – or being fearful – Fear in that sense is probably our friend because it creates a state of biologic readiness that's necessary to put in a peak performance, whether it's intellectual or whether it's physical. But if we don't recognize that and we exclude ourselves from it, and then we let the self-talk control our actions, then we're in trouble. So again, it's the interpretation because the fear can actually be our friend. It could be like, hey, don't do this yet. Further investigation preparation required. It's not just something to be blatantly overcome. We have to see whether or not there is a reason why we shouldn't proceed forward in that instance, and fear is our friend. Mm -hmm. But it could be performance anxiety if that's the case, and it actually is your friend, because you cannot perform at your best unless there is a biologic state of readiness that's associated with the classical signs of fear. Did you ever see anyone who just couldn't, like they physically couldn't muster the courage to actually do the event on their big day, or does that just not really happen at the levels that you've been operating in? Well, I, I mean, again, we have an experience of that. Simone Biles at the Olympics, yeah. correct? I think we had yeah. an example of that recently here. And uh, again, um, I've really not seen it in a certain sense it, it, directly in my presence because there's always a screening in advance of where a person's psychological and physical readiness really is. You, you should know that. Yeah. And I feel that that's all part of the grooming and the developmental preparation aspects of that, that things like that should, there's always signs and visible signs of things in the making in their infancy that should be investigated early so they don't have a full-blown episode that would cause uh, some embarrassment to them or dishonor some uh, agreement that they've made to other people. Mm -hmm. What should someone say to themselves right before the starter gun goes off? I don't think that they should say anything. Mm -hmm. It it should be a full commitment to execute the first thing that has to go right. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a push off with the right pedal or whether it's your first word uh, going on the stage, all that should have been worked out mm-hmm. in your preparation. Yeah, it's too late at that point. It's so. too late. Yeah, it's too late. Yeah, it's too late. It's, it's executing the one thing that has to go right. 
that allows the snowball that, or the dominoes to start falling in your favor based upon your preparation. Yeah, it's interesting. The Special Forces, we had a, um, one of the Navy SEALs we interviewed spoke on the show, spoke about that moment in a plane before they do those high altitude, high opening jumps, very, very dangerous. Yeah. Um, people ask, what are they thinking in that moment? Are they thinking about their families or what is it? And all they're thinking about doing is executing the next portion 100%. of the mission. Otherwise, they're not going to make it home to their families. I see, it's, it's really not that difficult. Pe- yeah. People make it way too difficult. It's like our human nature, our fear-based survival instincts – are always making contingencies for everything that could possibly go wrong. Yeah. That's not what you look at. I helped a guy win a gold medal, you know, Greg Rutherford. He was uh, favored to win the gold medal in the long jump in the London Olympics, and he was starting to unravel two and a half weeks before the Olympic finals. So they brought me in to talk to Greg, and it's like, hey, Greg, here's the deal, man. You're just physically and mentally disconnected here. We just need to connect your brain back to your body. You're going to win the gold medal, and you're chasing perfection. You think that you will win by putting in the perfect jump. I'm telling you that – you guys are making contingencies for everything that could go wrong, and now you're confused. And you think that your brain is not going to see the one detail that you need to attend to to win. Therefore, you've already lost. I said, you just do the one or two things that count and you win. Don't change your warm-up. First four steps to the run-up. Foot hits the board. Presto, instant gold medal. And that's all he paid attention to for the next two weeks. Mm-hmm. Just make sure you do the one or two things that count. Step onto the field. Don't try to make this more complicated than it is. Because his entire life has been about preparing for that moment. Well, it should be, but we forget that. In times yeah. of uh, critical uh, make it or break it or pivotal life experiences, as I said earlier, people generally blow it mm-hmm. because they, they make it too important. So they, they change all their preparation. Their body's not used to it. Their timing's off. They think they need to control everything. The way you control everything is being properly prepared and put your trust in your preparation. You don't try to think your way through it because you can't think fast enough to integrate all the things that have to go right to put in the perfect jump. It's not possible, mm. but yet somehow we think that it is, and it's not. Mm. Uh, this is more common in, in places like special forces where people who want to com- compartmentalize different <laughs> things, but have you found that it's beneficial for people to adopt a character when they step into that arena? So it's someone who's might be a little bit detached. They know that when they step into that field, it's it's someone else who is an absolute monster who can get the job done. I think that's a, a technique that works well for some and it mm. doesn't work well for others. I think we need to know our own methodology and what works best for us to be able to call up who we need to be at the time of application. Mm. Uh, One of the things that you talk about that I really love is that idea of preparation precedes performance. I just think think that's so powerful. Can you talk a little bit about your steps in terms of uh, what it takes to prepare like a champion? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Well, there's uh, five steps that history has revealed. This isn't something I selected, but through observation, the very first step in preparation before you even step onto the field, you got to make sure that you've got goal clarity. You got to have goal clarity. You got to make sure you have the right goal. There's all sorts of goals, big, hard, audacious goals. There's moonshots. There's uh, smart goals. But as far as I know, the only goal that you should really have is the right goal for you at the right time. Once you have that, then it gives you focus or goal focus. It gives you the ability to hyper focus on what needs to get done. But you also have a peripheral awareness of the blind sides that are starting to form and better opportunities that you could seize to create a better outcome. That's why it always starts with goal clarity. Secondly, got to understand your motive. Why am I doing this? Because if you understand your why behind it, it will give you drive. If you don't have drive, then you can't perform at your best. The third step is impact. How is my achieved goal going to impact myself, others, the world around me, and my legacy? The reason why that's important is that when we understand impact, then we have a greater purpose to show up and make sure that we do complete the task and fulfill the goal. Uh, Number four, which is uh, champion's mind. The reason why a champion's mind is important is that it gives you courage the courage to do everything opposite of what everybody's telling you to do that usually isn't right. The champion's path is very different than what most people think it is. They think that it's contrary and it's actually not. It's really how it's done, but you have to have the courage to be able to do that, facing some opposition from public opinion. And then the final step in preparation is uh, uh, resources. You need to make sure that you have time and energy. you got the skills. You have the plan. You've got the materials and supplies. you got the toilet paper, and you got the Q-tips and everything else. And once you have all that, then you can trust your preparation. And why that's important is that you've already vetted yourself as being properly prepared. Mm-hmm. And at that point, there's only one thing left to do is to push the green go button. Mm. It's, there's so many people out there think that, hey, if I was born in a different situation, that'd be me. It's, it's the blueprint, like these linear things that you're talking about for someone to become a champion in their own domain. They've just got to recognize that, that roadmap and then just put one foot in front of the other consistently right well history has actually informed us of what it is but mm-hmm. sometimes it's hard for our human nature to recognize it mm-hmm. you know champions golden rule do the homework and the test is easy first you prepare then you perform but most people don't prepare adequately mm-hmm. they think that i would rather be doing something rather than preparing 
or I'll have to trust the universe to give me what I need when I need it. That no prolific achiever or champion ever does that. Mm-hmm. You know, they are very committed to their preparation because they know then when they have to step onto the field, the less thinking you do, the more you trust your preparation, the better your play is going to be. Mm. So again, it's completely contrarian. Yeah. You know, thinking about, uh, I had a pretty debilitating anxiety disorder when I was like in high school and as a young adult. And the moments when it manifested the most were at times when I hadn't prepared myself for that moment because that's, I was so classic. fearful for that. Yeah. It's, it's classic. It, it's almost yeah. like a cyclist should go out and crash because then he gives up hope and he comes back and now he's loose. Mm. So then he can perform as he does during the week, which is break world records, right? (laughs) So there's something that happens when we make it way too important. Yeah. So again, I think it is interesting and that's probably one of the most important thing. But Mm. but let me say also this, is that you have your preparation, you have your preparation side, you got your performance side, but there's something really missing there. And that's called the start. Because the start is its own little unique space that fits between preparation and pursuit of performance. And if you don't get your start right, it's like being able to win the Kentucky Derby, but you can't get out of the gate clean, so therefore you get last place. Well, there's that one little thing that you thought your preparation would take care of, but that has to be done very specifically so that you get out of the gate clean and the dominoes start to fall appropriately at the right mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. I think it might be good timing to talk a, a bit about the Champions Blueprint methodology that you talk about there. Are there some really specific elements of that that we haven't touched on yet that you want to make sure that we that we go through now? Well, I think the Champions Blueprint, again, is an overarching umbrella of mm-hmm. things that 100% have to be there to be able to consistently perform at your highest level. So with that being said, I'd like to begin with at least a segment of what that is, what I call the Champions Ladder. Mm-hmm. And the champion's ladder mean we all have to kind of climb a ladder to develop a core competency in very certain areas if we are going to have the capacity to perform at our best consistently, repeatedly, and predictably over time. First thing is, again, you have to have a champion's mind. You have to be able to make sober decisions in the heat of the battle, and you have to have the experience and the trust to be able to do that, number one. Number two, you have to be able to control your day. Because if you can't control your day, you can't control your life. And if you can't control your life, you can't perform at your best. Number three, like rung three on the champion's ladder, is that you have to understand that winning is a learned skill. It's not something that's come naturally to us. It's actually a learned skill that's practiced and that's applied. There's a methodology to it. Number four, uh, we have to be able to peek around the corner and see what's coming. We have to anticipate the future, meaning that in the future, what's the probability of some potential risks or problems that we don't need to have, are we prepared to be able to observe and see them, intercept them, and walk around them? And are we able to see opportunities that are there that can exponentially take us to the higher rung if we just recognize it and we seize it at the right time? And then the fifth rung on the ladder is you have to carry momentum. The most prized uh, commodity in today's, in the world that we live in, is momentum. You have to be able to know how to learn and maintain and carry momentum forward. Mm -hmm. If you can be uh, competent in those five areas, then you can play at your full potential. Mm -hmm. What about people who feel like they're at a career crossroad? They're like, look, I'm just frustrated with where I'm at right now. I feel like I'm being called for something else, but I'm having a hard time zeroing in on what that is exactly. Have you got any advice for those people? Yeah, I do. First off, that's natural. Most people think it's not natural because I'm, I'm told to stick with one thing forever. Well, I don't think that that's really necessarily true because every decade we're a different human being. There's a different lens that we look at life through that we can't see about, we cannot conceive of as being possible preceding that. You know, I was never going to be like my dad, you know, when I was a teenager, but of course I became my dad the older I got. So mm-hmm. again, there are natural periods throughout our life that we should anticipate that we should be looking towards making a correction in our life trajectory. That's Mm -hmm. necessary. Most people aren't prepared for that. They don't know where to go to get good counsel for that. But I'm telling you, it's absolutely a necessity. Mm -hmm. Linking that mind, body, and soul is sort of unclearing the mind, the the first step in in doing that. I feel like these days we're just, we're hit with so much noise just everywhere we go, especially if you've got, I love my kids, but there's a lot of noise in the home when when you've got young kids. Then uh, work stress, uh, I've seen work stress leads to divorce. It leads to so many other other challenges as well, is is uncluttering all that noise to sort of just find out who you are again, the first step in that mind, body, and soul alignment. Before well, I, you can start doing some of those other things that you've just mentioned? Well, I think it, dep- it really depends on your age because you're mm-hmm. not going to get a 30-year-old to do that. There's mm-hmm. no way because a 30-year-old is only interested in achievement and conquest and career advancement and things like that. But 
you know, when you get to the tail end of the 30s and the early 40s, I call that the zone of doom. Mm -hmm. This is where there's a convergence of all the circumstances that cannot any longer be ignored. You've got kids that are older, you got battle fatigue, uh, you uh, deferred your uh, relationship, you've deferred your health to later, uh, you think everybody else's life is great, yours not. Uh, you start to question whether you really want to do this moving forward, maybe have some PTSD from pushing too hard, too fast, too early. There's all sorts of things that happen. And so there's a natural point at that age in the early late 30s or early 40s where you start to examine and ask a set of questions that you would never have asked in the early 30s just because you had aspirations, you had confirmation of your value, you felt that there was nothing in your way, there was a certain amount of freedom uh, but then we find out that in our late 30s, early 40s, wait a minute, hold on, I'm not so sure that this is where I need to be. I'm not sure that I like this. Maybe I'll uh, quit and I'll canoe around the world for two years or whatever. Or I, I have PTSD from pushing too hard on my first business, even though it did well. I don't know if I want to ever do that again. So there's all sorts of things that I anticipate that I will be addressing in my clients based upon their age, mostly, mm. in, in part of that being their history. I'm laughing because I'm in that zone of doom. There you go, man. It's like I know. It's right so, now. It's so true. It's I so know. true. And then Uncle, some Uncle of, Jeff knows. Yeah, That's yeah. That's what I'm saying. Uncle Jeff knows. Because <laughs> some of the questions that I've been asking myself recently is, should I be structuring my entire life about me performing the best I can so it sets the best example for my children? Or should I be changing my entire life to make sure it's about nurturing my children's potential? Sometimes that dictates like so many different different things. And I'm sure the truth is somewhere in the middle, but it's- um. These are questions that I've, I find out, at least for me lately, have been instinctively popping into my uh, into my head. It's it's completely predictable at your age. It's one hundred percent predictable. I have never seen this not happen in the zone of doom thirty eight to forty three. Mm. Never seen it not happen. Yeah. And so the, the the point is is that where do I push when and how much do I need to be available to do my job as a father as a partner. Mm. And that's all got to get worked out. And I could tell you that there's always a, a way of doing that that makes sense for the specifics of what the relationships are. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes not being available is the more important lesson to your children that you're not available when they necessarily want you, but they realize that there is a structure and there are certain things that have to go right to create a harmonious home and to be able to hold the uh, relationship in the organization of the home itself. So mm -hmm. a lot of this is very specific to the uh, people that are involved in this and where they are in their development. But mm -hmm. all of this in my uh, experiences predictable. It has to be addressed with correctly. It can't be swept on the, the uh, carpet indefinitely. Mm -hmm. That's so that's so interesting because I think so my wife, she travels a lot for work as well and she gets very hard on herself, um, very sad for those moments when she, you know, I have to travel a lot as well. Those moments you feel like you're missing out on things with the kids, especially when they're young and they're growing so fast. But what you said there, it can actually be a blessing for the kids 100%. to develop a little bit of self-sufficiency. A hundred percent. So all that's got to be worked out and, and that's why at least what I do, because I, I have competency in the human domain plus in the business domain. So I know how to merge those things together mm -hmm. in a way that allows us to be able to check the box. Like, you know what? I'm doing enough of everything that I need to do to be of highest service to the obligation of my family, to my career, uh, and my contribution to humanity. Mm -hmm. That's all going to get worked out for us to be confident and certain that we are living a life well lived. Mm -hmm. It's been a crazy time for the world the, the yeah. last three years. Uh, what is stopping most people from living a life of significance today? I think uncertainty. They're afraid uh, economically. Uh, there are world implications that are out there. Uh, uh, I, I think the world's changing so fast. There's a relevancy question. Um, there's a question of competency and uh, um, preparedness to be able to seize and adjust to things in a world that's changing rapidly. Um, those are the things that I see quite frequently. Mm. Are there some practices or rituals that people should incorporate so they can win the day uh, every day? Yeah, there are. I, I mean, I think, you know, number one, you have to decide how you're going to show up every day. It's probably the most important decision that you can make. You have to make sure that you have a day of productivity in front of you that's well organized. You have to balance your efforts with your recovery, because if you're not recovering day in and day out, you're going to blow yourself up which is probably one of the greatest risks of all is to have a catastrophic relationship failure mm -hmm. or a personal health event or a financial ruin. Those are all possible. And you want to make sure that you're steering uh, clear of that. And by recovery, you're talking about mental recovery just oh, as much as physical recovery. Yeah, one and the same. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're, you can't extract the mind from the body. They're, they're yeah. literally one and the same. Mm -hmm. And what are the most essential parts of your daily routine these days? 
Well, I think there's you know six to eight things that you can do in the morning before you engage with people mm-hmm. that is like a, an appetizer menu mm-hmm. that we all favor certain things. But I would say by far the most important decision anybody could make is how they're going to show up every day for people. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I say that is because my daughter, you know, we adopted our daughter at the age of 10 from Columbia, a very unusual adoption. And she was severely abused as a child. Like, it's almost beyond disgusting to even think about it. But had people shown up differently for her, she wouldn't have the trauma that she's have to live with that, that has a, a bit of an uncertain future to it as well. She's a beautiful human being, by the way, but that was an imposition that did not have to happen. Mm-hmm. And we have to make the decision consciously, how are we going to show up today? Am I going to show up from my greatest strength as a human and be an example to other people what's possible? Am I going to give everything that I could give to other people, not as a human sacrifice, but as a demonstration of the value of what humanity is capable of? Am I going to be able to walk off the field tonight and believe that I earned my meal or my sleep because of the way that I interacted with people? I think people really need to think about that. To me, that's the most important thing you could think of and decide consciously every day. Mm. The parenting journey, it's such an interesting one. It teaches you so much about yourself and, and the yeah. world. Um, you had so much experience working with so many different personalities. What did you- <laughs> Yeah, so many. Uh, what, yeah. Did, what did your parenting journey teach you that you didn't already know before? I, I think by far that- um, you have to be able to leave it all on the field. And if you can't love, you can't leave it all on the field. Mm -hmm. And so it it taught me the real meaning of a deeper love where, you know, it is a one way street. That's okay. It's meant to be, you don't give to get, Mm -hmm. you show up a service to other people and you do what has to go right on their behalf to give them a chance. The our uh, ambition for our daughter was not just to save her life, but to manifest her potential. And um, when you face something that is so daunting in its magnitude and implications, you get sober really fast about making certain choices that are necessary to be able to fulfill the obligation and the objective that you set in front of yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to me, and I think that's a really important um, uh, point of distinction in a life because there has to be a point in our life where we ask a different set of questions that we normally would not ask that draws forth our highest capacity. And if life is too good, you're never going to change. You're just going to ride the wave of whatever you're experiencing. I'm not going to say exactly in the fun zone, but until you've been faced with uh, a sustainable effort that is unrelenting over time, where you're faced to ask a different set of questions, I don't think that we have it as humans to be able to draw forth that highest capacity that's within us. I just don't know that that's possible. It's Mm -hmm. our greatest gift. Raising my daughter was by far the hardest thing that I've ever done. The Olympics was easy compared to this. Mm -hmm. But the rewards that uh, are reciprocal, that go both ways, the the best experience I've ever had in my entire life. Are there some little um, tips or tactics that you have done with your daughter that 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 you're open to sharing here in terms of perhaps how you set her up to win the day or you can make sure that you reconnect with her uh, later in the day or what someone can say to themselves, their kid before they go to school? Yeah, a couple of things that remind me every time she didn't speak English when we adopted her, we didn't speak Spanish. We had no language. I mean, zero, like no language. That was one of the challenges that we had. But I always said to her before she even understood English, I said, don't be average. Every time she'd walk away and go to school, I'd say, don't be average. You know, because I I wanted the neural pathways to start getting etched that even though I've been exposed to the most heinous abuse possible, there's still something within me that can prevail. And it all starts with not believing that you're average. So I wanted her to hear that. The other thing is that I would tell her, her name is Ken, K-I-N, Ken. I'd say, Ken, Dad needs to tell you something. I don't expect you to understand what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it just to go on record so when this circumstance arises in the future, we can come back and talk about it. Uh, and so what she did, she learned to trust me. Like I was not giving her another lecture, but I was giving her some useful information that she may not understand, and I don't expect it to change her behavior. But I do want her to know that we're going to come back and talk about this at the right time in life to pick up where we left off. So she learned to to really trust me. Mm-hmm. And kids that are severely abused, they have ma- huge trust issues. Mm-hmm. So that those are some of the things. And to always love her and to always be there, to be gentle, to be kind, to not overindulge her. I told her actually three things. I said, Ken, 
there's three things you got to know. Number one, you're always going to have enough to eat. She she stole all of her food. She told me that she used to pick up, take gum off the bottom of uh, toilet seats and put it in her mouth and chew it to stave off hunger pains. That's how poor they were. And I said, you will always have enough to eat. And I said, number two, I'm never going to let you down, which means that me, Jeff, had to do everything that I said that I was going to do for her. Even th- th- the smallest thing, I could not not do it because her trust in me was solely dependent on my ability to deliver on my promise to her. But I also said, you've had a tough life. I know that, but you still got to earn your place on the team. There are no free gifts. You got to do your chores and you got to do and follow the family rules. And so those three things were kind of the prefacing guidelines that we lived our life through. And eventually uh, she was an honor student in high school, but we both knew she cheated her way through the whole thing because she was a master ringleader for that sort of stuff. She was creative and her mentors would have been very proud of her for that skill. But when she did her own homework and was on the Dean's list, she graduated from four-year college, uh, summa cum laude. Uh, I knew that she was back and she was able to perform at the level of her same age counterpart. So it, it was our, literally our miracle. Mm, I love that. Thank you so much for being open and, and, and sharing that. Easy to do. Uh, you see a lot of people who are um, cheering cheering on sometimes way too aggressively at sporting events, parents watching their watching their kids. Uh, how harmful is that? And, and, and what can people be doing if they're watching their kid participating in sporting events to make sure they're getting the, the best out of their development? Well, I think, number one, it, it needs to be within whatever the framework of their enthusiasm is, that is kind of the the set limit. You don't want to prod and poke and push beyond that because then you start to invade a a certain uh, space that may be harmful later. Mm -hmm. Uh, We certainly want to make sure that we analyze what went wrong, what went right. You want to do a debrief on everything, but you don't want to be too critical. You want to kind of praise the things that they did well and mention and take a look at the things that that stand uh, room for improvement like that. you certainly don't want the relationship to be contingent upon how well they perform on the field. It needs to be completely independent of that. Um, I found that certainly a pep talk afterwards so that you leave the field you know, clean. You've had a little bit of a debriefing. They know that everything's okay. They're not going to get yelled at or punished. It won't be a silent car ride home. I think those are all the things that we look at because the big, the great shakeout comes in the early teens. And that's where people are either encouraged to stay in the game because of what they've experienced prior to that, or it's just a little bit too much pressure and they opt out because they can't take the pressure. Mm. How do you feel about that trend towards participation trophies and things for every single person who's out there rather than moving away from recognizing the one or two or three people who would had the best performance on the day? Well, I, I think it's a self-validation issue. I mean, I think anybody that gets something for free can't look at it and say that I earned it. You know, so I think that there's that side to it. I feel that we need to I'll tell you a story. Like my mentor, uh, he was 76 and I was 18 when I met him. Just a beautiful human being. I owe him just about everything. One of my angels. And he said to me, look like you're having a bad day, Jeff. I said, I am. You know, I haven't had many good ones. I come from a welfare family. He said, well, would you like a helping hand? And I thought to myself, oh my God, you know, this guy's read my mind. He wants to offer me a helping hand. How did he know that? And so I tried to find the words to tell him, yeah, man, you know, it's like, thank you so much. If there's every day where I need a helping hand, it's, it's today. Thank you. And he looked at the movie, his steely blue eyes. You sure you want a helping hand now? I said, yeah. He said, you got one at the end of each arm. He turned around and walked out of the room. <laughs> That's what he did. And I knew and he knew he said the right thing to me mm-hmm. because he cared enough about me to not intervene with me it was my moment of truth to figure it out. Yeah. And he knew that if he took it away from me, it would have disabled me. And I knew the same thing. And I stood up just a little bit taller after he walked away because I knew that he was right. And I knew the ball was back in my court. That was a life pivotal moment for me. How old were you at that stage? I was 18. Wow. And what amazing, obviously such a vivid memory for you today. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it is. And it, I, I, oh, I, you know, as I said, I have four or five uh, angels that came into my life that played pivotal roles that were indispensable for me and crafting me for who I became, so on and so mm. forth. Uh, what about the average person who just has a – they? it's not necessarily about setting the goals. They just feel like they don't have any motivation to follow through with things, whether it's a weight loss goal, a gym membership, to stop smoking, give up drinking, whatever it might be. Um, what can those people do to start actually stepping into that change and making it sustainable? Well, I think, again, it goes back to uh, – Goal achievement is a learned behavior. 
success is a learned behavior. They never learned the skill of winning. It's what they didn't. And so the program that I've created uh, called the Champions Success Roadmap goes through exactly what it takes from inception of idea to choosing the right goal to being properly prepared to then start to pursue it and achieve it. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I feel that you always start with, let's look at how this is done. It's not just will and talent like we talked about earlier in our conversation. There's plenty of will and talent that goes nowhere. It's about do you understand the skill of winning? There's a recipe to this that when followed is predictable. So you start with small things, so you learn the model. Then as your aspirations start to grow, then you can apply the same model because it's exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. They haven't had access to that, so then they don't believe in themselves. Or they've taken a program that tells them, if you follow this, you're going to connect yourself with your bigger future. Your greatest dreams will manifest. I mean, a lot of these things can't deliver on their promise, quite honestly. And they think, well, look, if the expert's right, then I must be wrong because I can't get to the place that the expert tell me that I can. Therefore, there's something wrong with me and I can't do it. And I think that is rarely the case. It's that they have not learned the skill properly. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what is the bravest thing that you have seen on the sporting or in the sporting arena or the best example of the, the champion mind that you've ever seen? Yeah, a couple things uh, come to mind. Um, uh, number one, um, I thought of a more vivid example that is not um, related to the sports world, but I think it's a little bit too graphic to, to be able to share. So I'll, I'll reserve and abstain uh, from that. But um, I've seen people that when a competitor is injured, they stop and take themselves out of competition to sit with the injured uh, opponent and tell, uh, safety comes and they're properly administered to. I see that a lot because that's when you strip away the sport and now you've got the humanity side of it. And it's um, extremely provocative and emotional when you see that because you see that sport does transcend the competitive side of it. Uh, and there is a huge humanity side to this as well, that if we dissect sport and we look at it at a much deeper level, we'll see that there's a richness of the human experience there that we can learn a lot from. Mm, so true. I love that. Uh, final question before we move into the win the day rocket round. Uh, on, your, <laughs> <laughs> on your best day, what's an affirmation that you would write on a flashcard that you could show yourself on your worst day? Well, there's always room at the top for the best. Mm. Um, I say that frequently and I do believe that, but I would also say that there's only one of you in all of creation there's no uh, another us. You know, there's 350 billion people that have been on this planet since the first footprint. And there's only one of us that has a uniqueness to contribute. And we should never forget what that is. We just need to find it, cultivate it, come from it, manifest it, and share it. But um, there's always room at the top for the best. Mm, so good. <laughs> Well, let's now move into the win the day rocket around. Ten questions and some quick answers. You up for this one, Jeff? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Number one, what quote inspires you the most? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it ain't what you know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. <laughs> awesome. Number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Uh, morning tea, latte. Mm -hmm. Number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18-year-old self? Uh, seek wisdom. Number four, what book do you give the most or what book changed your life the most? Well, one of my clients, uh, Chris Voss, wrote the book, Never Split the Difference, mm -hmm. one of the best ever. Yeah, what was it about that book you love so much? Uh, just a, a negotiation, again, is a learned skill and we should never discount ourselves. We need to learn to negotiate and stand up for ourselves. Mm, it's a great book. Chris has come on the show too yeah, as well. a great guy. Yeah, he's got some Good great stuff. Uh, number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? Yeah, I would say it's my gentleness. Even though I was Olympian, kind of a, a lethal assassin, so to speak, I, I'm very gentle and I'm very uh, introverted in a certain sense. I'm not shy, but uh, that's really served me well because people really believe me when I say something to them. I, I bring a high degree of credibility just because of my presence of being. Mm -hmm. And you, you have this this excellence. It just comes across in everything you do as well, Jeff. I want to acknowledge you for that. Mm, You're you. an amazing guy in, in every interaction that, that you and I have yeah, had. That's very so. generous. Thank you. Uh, number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? 
It's your best friend because it shows you what you need to improve on. It's a shortcut, actually. Mm. Love that. Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Oh, that's a good one. Gosh, I can think of only about a thousand people I'd like that to be. <laughs> be <a> big so, <laughs> bench. Um, I would say Jesus. Mm. Any questions that come to mind or would you have to wait and see? No, I, just to be in the sheer presence to uh, kind of experience that would mm. be uh, just a, an amazing experience. Mm. Number eight, uh, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? Oh, that's another good one. <laughs> First thing that came to mind was the uh, undo button on a computer. <laughs> that's great, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I got it back. <laughs> <laughs> Very valuable. <Yeah. laughs> you know, on Gmail, sometimes you send yeah, something yeah, and it goes oh straight no. away and it's like, oh, it's, it's gone. gone. <laughs> uh, number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. Uh, to do a TED Talk about our adoption. Mm, love yeah. it. And final question, number 10, what's one thing you do to win the day? Say that again? Uh, what's one thing you do to win the day? Uh, as I said earlier, the most important thing I always think about is how am I going to show up today on behalf of others? Mm. Well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Dr. Jeff Spencer. I'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow him on Instagram at dr.jeffspencer. Grab a copy of his books on Amazon and check out more about the man himself and how he helps people on his website, drjeffspencer.com. Again, all that and more will be linked in the show notes. Jeff, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks again. Deep appreciation. Thanks for joining me on another episode of the Win The Day podcast. We want to hear your thoughts on what we covered today, so drop a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway, any questions you have, or what actions you'll be taking as a result of what was shared in this episode. And if you found value in the Win The Day podcast, leave a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You'll find a link to both of those in the show notes. It'll only take you a few seconds and more ratings really helps other people discover the show so they can get the mindset upgrade they need and we can bring more winners into the Win The Day movement. That's all for this episode. Get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.